Well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. As we always do, today's webinar is a really good one, um, but uh, before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the event, just know you will be able to access it later on demand. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's presentation you have a question for our panelists, please don't wait, don't hesitate. Just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your questions and we'll get to as many as we can near the end of today's webinar. And then finally, also before we end today's webinar, we'll be doing a drawing for three $50 Amazon gift cards. So stick around, please. Uh, maybe you'll be one of our three lucky winners. Okay, with that, we will kick off today's webinar, which is destroy long build times using Docker, Go, Java, Bazel, and Codefresh. Our speaker today is no stranger to the DevOps.com webinars. It's Dan Garfield, who is the Chief Technology Evangelist at Codefresh. Hey, Dan, how you doing? <laughs> Good, thanks for, thanks for having me. Hey, no problem. I'm gonna put myself on mute, let you get to it. All right, well, I have hopefully a treat for all of you today. Uh, I wanted to go as clickbaity on the title for this as possible. So good on all of you for uh, for uh, <laughs> succumbing to my trickery. Uh, basically, it probably means you're all good YouTube fans. And so uh, it's uh, mostly meant in jest. But at any rate, uh, I did want to call out and thank uh, two contributors to this uh, this webinar who are Guy Salton and Kostas Kapolinis, who are uh, uh, on the Codefresh team here. They actually um, did uh, contribute some of the work to some of these slides and I actually stole some of their slides. So I, I wanted to call that out before I uh, before I uh, got in trouble later. So at any rate, to introduce myself, my name is Dan Garfield and I am the Chief Technology Evangelist for Codefresh. Uh, I'm also a Google developer expert focused on containers, Kubernetes, GKE, and cloud. Um, and I'm also a member of the Forbes Technology Council. So. Uh, I do uh, a lot of work around CI/CD, um, advanced deployment methodologies, uh, and then also just on sort of productivity engineering. So, uh, super happy to have you. Um, and uh, I should have put on here. You can follow me on Twitter at Today Was Awesome. Uh, if you forget that, just think how you felt at the end of this webinar. Just say, "Wow, today was awesome," and then you know, then you'll be able to find it. So. Um, uh, follows, uh, follows appreciated. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button down below. <laughs> All right. So, so first off, uh, why do we want to speed up builds in the first place? I mean, this is pretty obvious, right? But actually, um, some of you probably need help making the business case for why you should even spend time on this. And so let me just break down a scenario here. Let's say you had a hundred engineers that you needed to support and they were each doing five builds a day, which you'd probably be low actually. Um, and let's say that we could save, we could cut off five minutes from each build. And let's say those engineers are making 150K a year. We're talking about by just cutting off five minutes, saving almost three, a little over three quarters of a million dollars. So a year. Uh, so is it worth, um, you know, a few hours of your time to do some optimization on your builds and on your test systems? Uh, absolutely. Even if you only had 10 engineers to support, we're still talking about about $78,000 a year that you'd be saving just by cutting five minutes. And in fact, the stuff I'm going to show you today uh, in many cases actually saves quite a bit more time than that. Uh, so that time is, is incredibly valuable. Now, it's not just about the time. Um, in fact, it's also about making your developers happy. And so there are some more intangible benefits, right? So if you have very fast build systems, really great developer tools, really great developer experience at your organization. Obviously, people are going to be happier, right? Um, and their creativity is going to flourish because there's not as much pain to try something new, to do something interesting because the tooling is so good. Uh, and of course, you can iterate much, much faster um, than you would have otherwise because you're building, you're getting your test systems going, you're, you're able to do more tests probably, you're able to, able to get more feedback to your engineers more quickly. Uh, so actually code quality also usually ends up going up as, as part of this. Um, so in fact, uh, we actually have 
um, some stats that we gathered from a few different uh, a, a few different companies where uh, by doing some of these things they're actually able to pull their their pipeline execution time down much more than five minutes um, t- from 20 minutes to one minute from 25 minutes to five minutes from 20 minutes to two minutes uh, and again because you're doing these kinds of operations all the time the impact of just a little bit of improvement is huge um, now, as we go into, uh, basically, we're going to talk about three different things, mainly. We're going to talk about how to use uh, distributed caching in a strategic way and kind of the benefits of that. Uh, we're going to talk about optimizing Docker builds. And then we're also going to be talking about multi-stage builds and why you should use them. Uh, and uh, of course, we're going to talk about uh, Java and Bazel and, uh, and and Go and all these other things. So uh, so you'll all, they'll all be fresh in your mind. and. Um, you'll have some good tips now with this with this particular presentation what we're doing was actually we're going to cover quite a bit of breadth and my hope is that even if you're an expert in one of these areas you're going to get a lot of information about some other things that maybe you didn't know uh, that are going to be useful so if i'm covering something that you feel like you you know really well uh hang tight for two minutes and we'll get on to something else and, and hopefully that'll be more new um, and just a reminder as we go into this please use the question uh, function within within uh, go to webinar because it's really helpful for me to get questions because it helps me I can cover content that you want me to cover and it also lets me know that you're listening which makes me more excited so uh, at any rate let's get let's get into this um, and before we before we jump into the main topic just to introduce where we're coming from so uh, I'm, I'm coming from codefresh right and uh, codefresh is actually a CI CD platform that replaces systems like Jenkins and Spinnaker um, uh, and basically, we are, our focus is on cloud native applications, uh, and we focus actually quite a bit on speed. Um, it's one of our main points is that we spend a lot of time on speed optimization because we find that uh, CI/CD is so critical in that area. Anytime you have re- tasks that you're redoing all the time, the speed becomes super critical. So let's. Um, Get into it to share a little bit about our architecture. We have a uh, we have a microservice-based architecture, and if you want to know more about how we do um, how we do uh, the uh, CI/CD pipelines for this micro microservice architecture, there actually is another DevOps.com webinar you can watch. That's microservices CI/CD for microservices best practices. Um, but we need to be able to support. Uh, not only large sets of Kubernetes clusters, um, but also build nodes uh, as well as on-prem uh, instances. Um, and so we need to be able to have a really robust caching mechanism that people can use to um, basically get fast builds no matter what uh, without, uh, without a lot of headache. And so this is kind of where we're coming at this angle from is needing to support um, tens of thousands of users who need to have that speed and that caching available for them uh, and all that optimization sort of built in. So um, we're going to get into it. Uh, now, one of the first things that um, that people notice when they start going into CI is that usually their build systems are not as fast as their local machines. And uh, I actually uh, saw, I saw this firsthand one day. I was uh, visiting a friend at a uh, a company who would prefer that I not mention their name. I think, um, but you you probably use uh, their their services, their tools every day. Um, and I was visiting a friend for lunch, and uh, next next to his comp- his desk, his colleague had two computers on his desk. And I said, "Whoa! Why has this guy got two computers? What kind of engineer is this? He's so good. He can do two keyboards at once. Amazing productivity." And he said, "No, actually, uh, every time he runs a build, that machine is just dead for 20 minutes. And so as soon as he submits a build, he just moves over to this machine and starts working on it." And I thought, "This this sure is an example of of a rough uh, lack of CI/CD systems um, that could run this for him." Um, and uh, to, to understand why this is, um, usually when you're building locally, a lot of tools are designed to take advantage of your local hard drive to store components and dependencies and other things like that. And when you move to a CI system, oftentimes that's not really there. Um, and local building 
it just isn't actually a very good solution. Um, one of the issues is if you have a, a real, you know, intense build system, if you have a lot of tests or things like that, you actually block your engineers from working unless unless you get them an extra machine, like I saw uh, at this company. Um, and the other issue is that uh, it's not very secure or traceable. So they actually might be building components, and I actually see people push artifacts from local machines sometimes um, up into production, which is terrifying because I don't know what code is in that artifact anymore because you may not have even checked it in because you built it locally and you didn't even need to because you uh, you um, you uh, were able to push from your local machine uh, and and also um, you know if that local machine was compromised for some reason maybe they opened a bad email attachment or something um, we may have actually injected some code and I actually saw this happen uh, I've seen that happen at companies before. Um, so local building is uh, useful for maybe uh, you know smoke testing, but in general, um, a good CI system is gonna is gonna take care of this. So why do CI systems usually struggle with speed? Well, we have to look at the way that the build architecture happens. So usually, what you have is a number of different build nodes. Now, this could be on a Kubernetes cluster. These could be EC2 instances. These could be boxes sitting under somebody's desk. And oftentimes those build nodes are specific to certain pipelines. And so you maybe reuse the same build node. And then you also have distributed build systems where you actually have um, build nodes coming and going. And uh, so what oftentimes I'll see is someone with a legacy CI CD system um, will basically mount a local volume on that node. And that's okay. Um, but it runs into issues very quickly where uh, they might have builds colliding, um, where you actually have two different systems running and they're trying to use the same cache and they, they don't play nice. Um, I also see issues where with permissions. So one of the things that they'll do, uh, even in a distributed build system, is they'll kind of copy that local volume. But the issue with that volume is that when you run a build, oftentimes it may actually contain sensitive things like secrets uh, in addition to the artifacts and the cache that you want and so the way that you handle this volume is actually pretty pretty critical um, you want to have really good rules for when this volume is going to be available when it's not going to be available when it's regenerated um, how it's invalidated and uh, it's very easy for people to mess this up because um, most ci cd systems basically rely on you to build all of those rules yourself so um, this is this is a bit of a struggle. Now, the way that we do this with CodeFresh, um, uh, to, to understand with CodeFresh, every single step in the CI system is actually its own container. Um, and that means that it runs in an isolated space. And so what we do is we actually attach a build volume that is both persistent and distributed. And we're going to get into this system a little bit deeper. And this volume basically will automatically take all the caching but we've built in all the rules to say, hey, if this is a pull request, it can't get the, the volume from uh, the main branch, right? Because that might contain stuff we don't want, and it also should be separate anyway. Um, and then if it's for a different user, it's going gonna, it's gonna to behave a little bit differently. Uh, and then how we invalidate it and all those kinds of things is, is all kind of baked into the cake. Um, and the big result of this is that without really doing anything, you get that same local-like build experience except for a distributed team. So it has a big impact on speed. Now this distributed caching mechanism that I mentioned, um, you can have a single volume in a static node set. So maybe you have only a few build nodes that you want to use, or maybe you have a or maybe you have a Kubernetes cluster that's spinning up lots of nodes. It doesn't really matter from a distributed caching perspective because it's actually going to pull copies of that cache, that volume to use um, automatically and it's going to follow those rules and so if I have you know maybe one node uh, is running a build for my master branch and another node is running um, a bill I remember running another build for pull request those actually shouldn't be using the same cache uh, because it's not safe um, uh, but for my pull request I'm still going to get the benefits of uh, of caching uh, for pull, for that pull request set and especially if they if I run multiple pull requests um, and so the way that the developer experience tends to work, you're going to get this caching available automatically without any overhead, without any additional configuration, um, at least when you're using CodeFresh. Now, if you're using Jenkins, 
uh, you can you can kind of write a lot of rules and uh, you can kind of get at least part way there um, but you do need to spend quite a bit of time on that optimization to make that happen so uh, let me show you what the result of this cache is uh, I'm going to jump into code fresh to look at a build that we did um, and this is a build where I'm building the application uh, Hugo so Hugo is a fairly popular project most people are familiar with it um, and what I've done here is I'm going to zoom this in a little bit what I've done here is I've set up a pipeline and I'm calling that pipeline twice in parallel uh, from, uh, from this pipeline over here. Let me hide this. And what you can see is that when I run the pipeline with the cache, my build executes, my entire pipeline executes in about 50 seconds. Uh, and then on, so if we look at the YAML here, uh, and I zoomed in too much, so that's not because I want to show. Um, what you look here, uh, what you see is this is the step and it basically just says, hey, go run this pipeline, right? And then here on this cache disable, I've added directives to not use the cache. Um, now these actually execute in parallel, which is also something that depending on how you handle that, that volume can actually be tricky, right? Because if you're running, if you have uh, the same mount point on two different builds, um, it's very common actually people run into collisions, right? So you wanna have a way to do this in a distributed way uh, that's not gonna cause that kind of issue. So that's what we've done here. Uh, so here where I run without the cache, um, it takes three minutes. When I run it with the cache, it takes 50 seconds. So already we've cut off, hey, we're like, we're like uh, what, 10 minutes into this webinar and we've already cut off, um, uh, uh, what, uh, uh, two, a little over two minutes. Uh, 210 to, to, to 11, uh, 2 minutes, 11 seconds. So we've already got one big uh, speed improvement just because we're using a distributed caching system, just because we're reusing our volume. Um, now we're going to dig into why this is working, and then it's going to give you some information about how you could potentially do this on your own build systems uh, if you didn't want to use something like CodeFresh. Um, so let's now go look at that distributed cache. So this distributed cache, the way that it works, and actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to zoom back over to this system here. So what we actually do when we run a build, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but maybe you can't see my mouse, it will be useful. Basically what happens is we store the cached volume as a Docker image, and then we push that Docker image back up to a repository, and then that cache, uh, that cache volume is basically um, kept and returned uh, in every instance that it's needed, no matter where it's building. So uh, I have that distributed caching system. Now I can actually run these locally. So let me give you an example. I've got this uh, pipeline here that I ran uh, in my in my CodeFresh system. I'm now gonna run this locally by doing a CodeFresh run and I actually can just reference the name and I throw on the flag local and this will actually run the build locally on my machine but it'll pull that, uh, that volume here. So this is an example of how this caching system is distributed. So what you'll see is uh, it actually just provisioned a volume, right? And it actually pulled that volume. It restores the pre-existing image um, and it runs very, very quickly. So I've already got all my caching in place and it's, uh, it's executing my pipeline as I would expect. Um, and essentially you can think of it like this volume is almost like a local machine that's portable to wherever the build is happening. Now, why is this useful? Well, uh, A, I wanna be able to use a distributed build system, right? So I wanna be able to expand out nodes willy-nilly without having to care about it. So this kind of this kind of system allows me to do that. I also wanna be able to run locally. Um, maybe I just wanna run tests locally or uh, and I, I just wanna get that feedback right here where I can maybe do debugging additionally. Um, but it's still running with the same rules and tool set of my CI system. So I know what I'm getting. It's always going to actually check out the code. Uh, it's always going to execute the way that I expect it to execute. So it's going to be more valuable from that perspective. Um, and then if I have distributed clusters, let's say I have different deployment environments and I have different agent running on those deployment environments where this pipeline is going to execute, it's actually going to be able to pull that cached volume into those areas as well. And then it's also going to cache that locally on whatever that node is. And so um, you're going to see instantly a big speed improvement from the way that this distributed caching system works uh, with CodeFresh. 
Um, so while that finishes up, I think we can move on. You can hear my fan spinning up as it runs that build locally. Uh, so now we are able to run this thing locally. And we can also, uh, there's an extra flag you can throw on here to actually specify to use a local volume for your cache. So you could actually separate it if you didn't want to go through the distributed, uh, uh, distribution, uh, which is pretty valuable. Now, we're going to get into the second issue. So uh, if you do want to get deeper into um, the build volume uh, stuff that I'm talking about, the distributed caching stuff, I actually would recommend... Um, there's a there's a oops I don't I don't know what I'm doing here. Uh, there's there's a there's an additional uh, event that we did that's called um, Docker based pipelines. And you can find this on DevOps.com, um, but you can also see it at CodeFresh.io/events. And I think is it container Docker based based. Uh, this one actually that covers it pretty well. The difference between VM and Docker-based pipelines actually goes pretty in depth on this. Um, and there's another one you can watch that's Docker-based. Uh, should show up. Yeah, Docker-based pipelines on DevOps.com. There we go. We got there. Um, so you can actually grab that video as well. It goes a little bit deeper on that distributed caching system. All right. So the second thing we're going to talk about now is. Um, those different kind of build toolings this is kind of a subset here. Um, now the issue is that a lot of times when you make a code change, it's very small, um, but underneath that you have a whole bunch of dependencies and extra libraries, not even external dependencies, internal dependencies to your application you have to build. And so it means that most of your build time ends up kind of being wasted because you're changing stuff that, um, that uh, you're rebuilding stuff that wasn't changed. Um, and this is kind of the default state for most programming languages. Some of them do it a little bit better than others. And what I really want to do is I only want to rebuild the part that changes. Now, there's a way to do this um, with, excuse me, with cached Docker layers. So we're going to get into that one a little bit more in depth when we get into the multi-stage build portion of this, uh, of this video. Um, but also build tools like Gradle um ha have the ability to do this go has the ability to do this and basil is sort of the um the peak of doing this it's it's really the best at this and so we're going to actually look at those individually now the other thing we can do is with go i can actually set my go path to be my ci volume my cf volume path if i'm using codefresh for example now if you're using your own distributed caching system, you're going to want to specify that it used that volume in all of your build arguments, um, and that will allow it to be reusable. Uh, Bazel does the same thing, and we're going to go deeper into Bazel uh, for a moment. Um, so let's look at that. So first, actually, I'm going to go over and do, uh, we're going to do a little bit of playing around with um, with uh, Basil here. Now, I don't, I don't think I'm a really a Basil expert, but I wanted to show how um, some of these things work. So I'm just going to use the Java tutorial because uh, I'm kind of a noob, right? Um, and I'm going to first, I'm going to do a Basil clean, a, a Basil clean, just so you can see what it looks like from scratch. Okay, so I've got everything reset. Um, I'm running. Yes. Okay. So now I'm going to run a Basil. Uh, build uh, for this Java application. And uh, this is going to, this, hopefully this will make sense in a second. So it's got to run about nine different operations to build all the different jar files. And it takes about 4.7 seconds, okay, for my critical path of, of build stuff, That's which is fine. Um, now, if I change my application, uh, and I'm going to open up Sublime Text here, and we're going to go into my Java app, and uh, basically, I have two different Java files that are doing stuff. It, it's a very simple application, right? And I'm going to now add a line to say hi to the SQL. Uh, and I'm going to add this in. And then we're going to rerun our build. Uh, and now we actually have that cache present locally, right? So when I run this, um, it only takes 0.24 seconds, right? So I went from four seconds to rebuild everything. I only changed one component. So it's going to rebuild quicker. Now with Bazel, I can actually go a little bit deeper than this. Um, 
So Bazel uses a build file, which sort of looks like, uh, if you squint at it, it looks a little bit like a make file. Um, and I'm gonna modify this to split up my greeter application to basically uh, work as a, um, what it's basically gonna do is it's gonna look at the class and, and what it relies on. So I can actually get down to the class level with my within my application. Now, one of the nice things about Bazel is it does work with Go, it does work with Java, it works with Node, it works with Docker, it works with pretty much anything. So it's kind of a universal build tool. It was created by Google uh, in order to optimize the um, the build times that they had and uh, is has a, has a huge impact over there. It's actually pretty normal for you to make a small code change on a you know, 20 gig code base and have it build within, you know, 200 milliseconds. So, uh, so now that I've modified this, uh, we're gonna make another change here. And we're gonna build this again. Now this time it should take maybe just a little bit longer because uh, I changed the structure of the application. Oh no, it's gonna take uh, about 13, uh, 0.13 seconds here. So it's actually running even faster now because we separated and you can see it actually runs with one process, one worker because it only changed one component. Um, now, if I go and now that I've done this, I've split it up into two separate systems. I'm going to add one more change and we're going to do this one more time and we should see even a, an additional speed improvement. So we actually just took this, um, from what would have been four and a half seconds down to 0 0.09 seconds. Now, I know what you're thinking back at back in uh, webinar land. You're thinking, uh, so I can save five seconds. Do I really care? Fair, fair point. However, your Java application is probably not these two jar files. Your Java application is probably huge, and so this kind of um, this kind of uh, system where we're only rebuilding the components that need to be changed is actually going to be a lot more valuable when you have a much larger build system. Um, and now with Bazel, the thing is what I showed you actually, it's, it's a bit complex. I mean, I'm showing you the, the build file and you can imagine that if I have a much larger project, this is going to get a little bit more complex to deal with. Um, and, uh, and that certainly is true. Um, but with a CI system paired with Bazel, uh, this stuff is reproducible very easily. Now, Bazel is actually not as popular with open source projects because a lot of people have a hard time running it locally. But if we're using the CI system with like a CodeFresh run pipeline and we tag it local, we're good, we get to reuse that Bazel system over and over again uh, without a challenge. Now, I just showed you some quick speed improvements here. And I'm going to show, whoopsie, I, I didn't mean to close everything. Uh, come back, come back, please. Um, what I'm going to, not that one. Uh, -oh, we've gone off the rails. Where's my, uh, <laughs> I, did I close my whole, oh, there it is. <laughs> Thanks oh, for your thank patience. goodness. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm going to go back and actually open up the, uh, I'm gonna just going to show you how we're using an application cache like Bazel in CodeFresh. So here's a pipeline that executed, and here's my Bazel build. And what you can see is actually I'm just using the freestyle step. I'm running a Docker image that has Bazel installed on it, and I'm just running a Docker build. I'm running my Bazel build command on that system. Um, and if we look actually at the uh, after cache, this actually just exports all of the, um, uh, basically the directory tree. And if we look, what you can see is that uh, once I run my build, um, Bazel will actually output a caching system. Now I can specify the path for this cache and I should change it to use my uh, CF volume path, because that means that cache will be there every time I go to build this. And now I get all the advantages of running Bazel locally in my CI system where it's actually much, much more important. So um, I'm gonna get a big speed improvement off of that uh, because, because of that. All right, now the next thing we're gonna talk about is optimizing layers. Now um, with Docker, uh, so, so basically you only wanna change the components, um, no, 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 let me, let me restart. 
So to understand Docker layers, when you go to build a Docker image, um, every single thing that you do actually creates a new layer, uh, which is essentially a new image. And Docker has to save that image locally uh, and push it in, and then it's going to be used for caching purposes, and it's also going to be used um, to uh, to um, basically speed up the time it takes you to push changes up. So what you want to do is you actually want to use those layers strategically. Now we're going to get deeper into Docker files in a second. So if this part doesn't make sense to you, it's, uh, it should click once we get to the next section. So let's uh, let's actually look at that now. Um, I'm going to move over to uh, Hugo now. What do I got on here? Let's go over to today was awesome, Hugo. All right. So now uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up a Docker file and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So um, the one thing I worried about when putting this presentation together is that I go through a lot of different topics and I worry that people will get lost. But hopefully that's also to your benefit. So as, if you do have questions, if you do feel lost, please shout it out um, so I can uh, I can answer those questions. Um, all right. So I've got a uh, this is the pretty much the stock Docker file. Um, for Hugo, I actually did add a uh, environmental variable um, to uh, to collect um, to actually set a Go proxy, which is for for almost every language. There's a way that you can specify uh, a binary cache to use. So, for example, if I'm doing if I'm building a Go project, if I'm building a Java project, oftentimes there are a bunch of binary dependencies that rather than rebuild those, I can just pull the binary and use those. And so you can actually use a binary cache for this. And then even on the first execution, you'll actually notice a speed improvement. So I, that's the only thing that I've added to this was that. Now, like I said, every single line you see here executes a new, uh, uh, a new layer. And so this is uh, about 20 different layers. And that means that you have to do a save and a write um, for each, for each execution, you have to save out a new image, which actually introduces some I/O overhead. So we can actually streamline this Docker image, uh, this Docker file, and make it easier um, to understand. And I wonder, uh, we don't have a way to pull people. I was just going to say, raise your hand if you're if you've used Docker Build before. Um, so I'm just going to try to by ESP guess how many people are raising your hand. Oh, good, it looks like most of you have done that before. Great, perfect. Um, <laughs> if you want to learn more about that, we have some other content on that too. But all right, let, let me get to this. I'll shut up and, and, and uh, optimize this. So what I'm going to do first of all is I'm going to gather up all of the uh, elements that could be done together. Now, environmental variables, uh, they can be pretty much be added at any time. And I can actually add them as a single layer because there's no value to me um, in running those separately. I'm also going to gather up my arguments and put them all together. Now, unfortunately, the way that arguments work, you can't combine these into a single line. So you really should use environmental variables whenever possible um, because I can actually take all of these and I can basically, by adding a multi-line argument here, um, I can combine all of these oops, into a single uh, single line. So this is actually now going to be just a single Docker layer instead of four Docker layers. Uh, so this is actually going to reduce the time that it takes. Instead of basically saving four Docker images, which is what, the way that the layer system works, it's now going to save one. Um, and the reason you want to use layers is because if you change a layer, you want to be able to use that as the caching system. These are environmental. Why am I going to change anything? I, I mean, even if I change something here, um, it's uh, it's not going to. Uh, I, I'd rather just just pull that all as a single cache. I'm going to get a much bigger speed improvement. These arguments could be converted to environmental variables, but I'm going to have to change a little bit more about my application to make sure it works differently. So I'm going to leave those together for the moment. Um, and then I actually probably don't even need this go environmental command because it's more for debugging purposes. So I could probably just comment that out. So I'm just going to remove that uh, since we're not doing debugging on it right now. And then I'm also going to go down here and, and combine any of these other components that I can. Now here, I run an apt-get install, 
and then I do some copy operations. Um, what I'm actually going to do is I'm just going to take the run here and I'm going to combine that by doing uh, an and and a multi-line. And now this will run as a single layer. Now this go get D actually pulls all the dependencies that haven't been loaded locally. So this actually should always run very, very quickly. Um, and from a caching perspective, uh, it's basically loading in a cache. So there's no reason for me to have it as a separate Docker layer. Um, and then I do my, my go install here. And then we're going to talk about this from, because we're actually using a multi-stage. Uh, so this file now is a little bit easier to read. And if I were to go and execute this, uh, we could go and execute this, but I've actually done this already in an example so you can see what the difference is. Now, what I've done here is I have a build using the stock Docker file and I have a build using the optimized Docker file. Uh, and you can actually see, um, you can see it's, both of these are executing without cache enabled because we only want to highlight the difference between the Docker file build. Now, if I enabled the cache, you would actually probably see an additional difference between these two builds because of the way that the layer caching works. So um, basically it means that when I change a component, it only is gonna rebuild the layer that needs to be rebuilt. Uh, so here you can see I saved about 15 seconds off of this build by using the optimized Docker file. Now again, 15 seconds doesn't sound like a lot, but again, if we if we add this up over 100 engineers, over five changes a day, um, it actually ends up being a fair amount of money that you're spending to not take the two seconds to optimize your Docker file in the way that I just did. You you now know all the tricks that you need to know to optimize your Docker file. You can go and apply that, and uh, you should have a pretty good um, you should have a pretty good result. And also, most Docker uh, 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 builds for real applications take quite a bit longer. Than, uh, than just one minute or two minutes. And so you actually would see an even a bigger additional improvement depending on the complexity of your Docker file and your builds. So that's optimizing Docker layers. Now we're gonna get into Docker multi-stage, which is gonna get, um, which I think is gonna be really, really valuable for you if you're not using Docker multi-stage builds. We actually find that a lot of people still aren't. Um, now we actually, this came out in 2017 and just, uh, this was about a week and a half ago um, people were saying, hey, here's how to do multi-stage uh, builds. And it was a super popular topic because most people actually don't know how to do it and don't know how it works. And it's actually pretty critical because not only does it save you time, but it actually increases the security of your containers that you build. So um, we talked about the Docker file a minute ago. For those that don't know, it's a, it's a, it's a domain-specific language just for creating um, containers. Um, and every Docker build that you do creates, every command that you do creates one layer, which we talked about. And then um, the end result is that you generate a Docker image uh, as an output. And this is an example of a pretty simple um, Docker file. This one is doing a Go build. Now we just looked at one, but this one, essentially all it's doing here is it's building a Go application and then it's it's exposing that so you can run it. So this is a very simple to use Docker file, but it's not one you should use because it's not using multiple stages. So let's get into that. Um, let's go look, uh, you can actually do that, whoops. You can actually grab this uh, link here um, and I could post it in the chat. I'll just post this over here. Uh, this, is a, this is a sample application that you can use to go and replicate this stuff that I'm going to go with you, uh, do with you here. And you can see our Docker file here uh, is uh, actually been updated to use a um, multi-stage. So we'll explain what that means. So the image that we really want to run should include basically just the runtime configuration and application that's needed to run the application. And that's it. Um, but the Docker file I just showed you, this one, this actually is going to include all of our build tools. Um, and in many cases, depending on the Docker file, it's also going to include things like tests. Uh, it's going to include linters. It's going to include the source code oftentimes. And this means that you have not only a larger image, excuse me, that's going to take longer to build because of the way that cache system works, but you also have a, sec a, a security problem because now if your compiler has a security vulnerability into it, in it it's now running in production and you have to worry about that. 
Um, whereas maybe that uh, security vulnerability wasn't a big deal when it was just running like in your CI system. So we can actually get rid of that. Now, the way that you used to have to do this if you didn't have multi-stage is you would basically have to have two different Docker files. You need to have one Docker file which would generate the base image and you need to have another Docker file that would copy that over and create your actual production image. Uh, and this system uh, stinks. <laughs> it requires two different Docker files. You need some orchestration to make it do that. And so we've, we've seen people make really complex make files in order to handle the problem of uh, of multi-stage Docker builds before multi-stage Docker builds were a thing. Um, and we still see people actually doing that today because they're not aware of the capability of Docker, of multi-stage Docker. So the big advantage of using this multi-stage Docker uh, file that um, Docker introduced is you get to use one Docker file. You only have one syntax to learn, and then that you can run the same build both locally and on your CI system. Uh, and of course you can create multiple stages. So it becomes really, really valuable. So basically you can think of it like this, a multi-stage Docker build combines multiple image builds into a single file and allows you to copy out to only the components that you need. Um, this, is, uh, this is a little bit more complex of an example to demonstrate it, but basically here you can see, I have a base image where I install curl. Uh, and then I have a second image coming from Debian where I'm pushing out uh, a file and I have a third image where I'm pushing out a different file. And then in my final image, um, I can do from base. So it's actually going to reuse the base image here, right? So it's going to, it's pulling this down and using it here. And then it's going to copy in the files that I need from these other uh, images. And it's not going to bring all of Ubuntu. It's not going to bring all of Debian with it. So the end result is that my final image is going to be much smaller. Right. So let's look at a multi-stage build in action here. And I'm going to go over, uh, and actually first to show this, I'm going to go look at images uh, within my CodeFresh UI. It's going to show all the images that I built. And you can actually see that there are three Go builds right next to each other. One is my Go app. And this is the default Docker file that I showed you. And it's 650 megs. So it's actually pretty large. If we look at the Docker file here, you can see it's that very simple Docker file that I showed you a minute ago. It just does the build and exposes a port. Um, and if we look at the layers, you can actually see it has quite a few layers that are contributing quite a bit of uh, size to this thing. Now, should I really need to include the entire Golang tarball inside of my production image? Um, no, I, I super don't need to. And this is actually one of the reasons that people use Go is that it allows you to create really super streamlined build binaries uh, because you basically can just copy a, a Go binary into a scratch image and it has everything that it needs to execute. And it's one of the one of the main reasons why it's such a cool language. Um, that's why all the cool kids in San Francisco are using it anyway. Um, so if I go back and now look at kind of one level of optimization uh, here, I, where I have a simple multi-stage example you can see this image is 100 megs. So we just we just eliminated like 500 megs on this thing. Now that means that not only is this thing gonna build quicker, but it also means that when I go to deploy it, the container is actually gonna start quite a bit faster because it needs to pull that, that image in order to run in production. Uh, and if we look at the Docker file, you can see um, this is actually pulling in those, those different images, like I mentioned, and this is the other example that I showed you. Now, um, the final version that I'm going to show you is the uh, full multi-stage example where this is now my Go app and look how much space is taking. Five megs versus 650 for that other, uh, I keep on accidentally clicking here. It's five megs instead of the 650 megs. So now we know that this thing is definitely going to start a lot faster. And if we go and look at the Docker file here, um, you can actually see that it's not much more complicated. The only difference here is that I add a from scratch argument and I copy just my build application, just the application that I built here, um, my, my bin sample here. I basically just copy that into my scratch application and expose a port and I'm good to go. And this image, because I'm using from scratch, it's not going to bring all the build tooling. Now, from a time to build standpoint, uh, this is also going to be better because it's going to treat 
the these layers up here as their own components and go is actually going to do this very well and it's going to pull them when it's when they haven't changed so if this hasn't if this go build hasn't changed it's it's, it's just going to be able to pull the layer instead um and uh if we look at this build it happened very very quickly within 48 seconds so this um this this multi-stage build has a huge impact on the size of these images and also their time to start up, which is also cr pretty critical, uh, especially if um, you know if you have applications that are failing and restarting, they'll restart almost immediately instead of taking a minute for the image to pull. So this is this has a lot of benefits actually. Now um, for Docker multi-stage, we're not going to have time to go through Java and Node and PHP and all these different examples, and so we have included links to all of these things here. Um, I would also recommend for Docker, we have a, uh, a post uh, called Docker Anti-Patterns, which shows how people really get this wrong a lot of the times. So I'd, I'd encourage you to check this out. Um, these slides are gonna be available after the webinar, and I think we'll send them out to you um, so you can do them. So, gosh, we covered a ton of stuff. In summary, saving just a few minutes, actually super valuable. So totally worth your time to go after and do. Um, distributed caching mechanism basically gives you the local build optimization for free. Uh, so it's um, it's actually one of the reasons that people choose CodeFresh is because we built that distributed cache system and it's built in. You don't have to do any arguments for it. There's no syntax for it that you need to learn. It just happens automatically. And you automatically just, uh, a lot of people when they come and they just pull over like their build, their build into CodeFresh, they immediately notice that um, five to 20 X improvement just because that caching system is there and it's fully thought out and fully baked out and it works automatically. Um, you can also pair this with your application cache. So you can actually push, uh, have Maven packages um, or, uh, or your go, go binaries or even your Basil cache, Basil cache. Um, sometimes people say Basil, now it's stuck in my head. Basil cache, you're gonna actually have your Basil cache all pull from that distributed volume. So when you pair those two things together, you get a massive performance improvement um, all, all on your builds that you're doing all the time. And then with Docker, with multi-stage Docker builds, using one Docker image for both the build and production, not only is that slow to deploy, but it also introduces a bunch of security issues because now you have to basically guarantee that all of your build tooling doesn't have any potential security vulnerabilities. It's just, it's just there's no reason for that. It's not, they should have never be in production anyway. Um, Multi-stage build also produces very lean, secure, production-ready images. And of course, because of that distributed cache system on CodeFresh, um, we actually cache all of the layers, all the image layers for those. And so uh, you get the speed improvement um, for that as well. So um, questions, we'll move into questions now. Obviously, if you wanna try these examples, you can try them on CodeFresh. There's a lot of principles here that you can apply regardless of what CI uh, CD tool you're using. And even for, for local build, um, you can use some of these different principles to help you speed up things. Um, but feel free to go try this at codefresh.io. You can create a free account. You get unlimited builds for free, um, but it will, it will limit you on concurrency, which is the other kind of thing in the room that we didn't really talk about is concurrency. Increasing your concurrency obviously improves build times. Um, so if you can run all your tests concurrently, maybe you can run a bunch of builds concurrently because you're you're, you're building for different uh, environments. Um, that concurrency is also going to be a really really big time saver for you. So if uh, if you weren't convinced that you should invest time in optimizing your um, build speed, your test speed, I hope you super are now, and hopefully you got a couple of tips, uh, uh, some information that you're going to be able to take and use. And we'll move into the QA portion. So thank you so much for that. And uh, I'm excited to get your feedback as well. So let's move into the QA. And I think, uh, Charlene, were you planning mm -hmm. to? Um, I am it? here at your side whenever you are ready for me to start firing questions off to you. Let's do it, fire them off. All right, All right. great. First question, um, and you may have actually already answered this, but for CICD orchestration, is your platform open source? Mm. So uh, CodeFresh, itself is like most um, most software out there where it has a lot of open source components. The entire platform is an open source, but um, Chart Museum is sort of a, a very popular example of an open source component. Also, we didn't we didn't talk about it, but um, we have a huge library of steps that you can use, and all of these are open source. So any 
any of the components that you want to use. Um, let's say we didn't talk about releasing it all, but let's say I want to do Canary deployments to, to Kubernetes. Um, we actually have an open source step for that. And it's it includes a Docker image that you can take and run locally. So there's tons of open source components here. Um, it's uh, it's actually just like, um, actually a lot like github.com, right? Github.com is built on a lot of open source components. Uh, the, the main platform is not open source. So good question. All right, great. Uh, next question, would we me need to move our code, which is hundreds of Java projects, into a mono repo to realize performance gains? Uh, no, not at all. Um, you do not need to use a mono repo in order to realize performance gains. Now, depending on which, uh, which build system you're using, there can be some benefits. So for example, Bazel actually really likes, um, really likes mono repo, um, but uh, uh, in order to get the gains from like a distributed caching system, they can be in separate repositories. Um, you can be using Docker images and Docker layers strategically to do that. Um, so you don't necessarily need to. And also, um, with the we, all of the examples that we did today all pull from a single repository, we could have in parallel pulled uh, from five or 10 repositories if we needed to uh, get all the code available within a single pipeline volume. So um, you don't have to go to monorepo to get those advantages. Um, uh, that being said, if you are using Monorepo um, with CodeFresh, we actually do have some built-in uh, features to help you with that because one of the issues that happens, uh, I'll just show you really quick. Let's say I've got my Monorepo code base and uh, I'm just gonna open my, my, um, my uh, pipeline here. Um, and let's say that I don't wanna trigger changes. I don't wanna trigger a build unless certain components have changed. I wanna trigger maybe different pipelines. And if I look at my trigger here, this is uh, this is set up so every time I make a, a change, it will run this uh, pipeline. And um, you're welcome to go run the pipeline with the secret there. But uh, here you can see I've got a uh, modified files expression. So I can actually filter and say only when stuff in this subdirectory changes do I actually want to execute that. So good question. Excellent. Okay. Next question. Where does static code analysis fit into multi-stage Docker builds? Ah, okay. So um, I do see a lot of people that like to move uh, test systems into their Docker file. I actually don't really like that convention. It has the advantage of being able to basically do a um, basically do a Docker build and it runs your tests for you, which is nice for local things. However, uh, a lot of tests can be sped up by doing them in parallel, which is so not something you can do in a Docker file. Um, so even doing a static code analysis, I would prefer to have that separate in my CI system as a separate step. And because I do have the ability to run like a CodeFresh pipeline locally and still use a distributed cache, I still get the benefits of, uh, of having something that's reproducible in lots of different systems. So um, that would be, uh, yeah, hopefully that's a decent answer to that question. Good. Okay. Great. I think we have time for maybe one or two more, maybe three. Uh, does CodeFresh directly connect with a Git repo and can it use an existing build configuration? Is it similar yes. to how Jenkins builds are configured? Uh, yes, it can do that. Um, I, I won't go into detail on it, uh, but uh, but yeah, you can have it use existing, like, like, like we just did with Bazel, right? I just used the Bazel build system within CodeFresh, right? Um, and uh, maybe I can, can I do a couple of these rapid fire really quick? Sure, um, go ahead. Some that are calling out to me. Um, one of the questions I saw was, we used to have uh, change traceability for the entire application lifecycle. Um, how should I do that? Well, I'll show you just in CodeFresh really quick. We didn't look at deployment environments at all, but I've got my Kubernetes dashboard here that shows all of my different deployed um, components. And if I go down and look at, for example, an application here, it'll show me what image is currently running in production. And if I click on that image, it'll actually take me back to that image view that you should be somewhat familiar with now, which will then show me um, even the commit shot. If I click on the commit shot, it's gonna take me into my code change. So I can actually, I just went from production to what code change is currently running in, in about two seconds. And of course I do have the logs for the build where this image was built and the pipeline. So I actually do have that traceability available here. So that was a great question. Um, does CodeFresh support make files? Yes, yes, you can do that. Um, there is one caveat where make files that are building Docker images 
uh, do require an additional level of um, like an enterprise level account with CodeFresh because uh, Docker socket access is required. However, if you're using something like, uh, we have the option to use Cryo as well at that level. Um, is the categories on CodeFresh steps are featuring libraries? Uh, no, they're not libraries. They're actually self-contained steps. They're self-contained Docker images. For people that don't know what I'm talking about, he's asking, are these different libraries that I can use? They're self-contained images, which are actually much better than libraries because libraries tend to conflict with each other. You have to worry about versioning between libraries. These are completely self-contained steps and they can be used um, anywhere. They can, you can actually use them locally because they're they include Docker images, uh, essentially. Um, so great question. And then uh, somebody asked, um, what about a price evaluation? So CodeFresh, we, while you can get the free, if you would like to try enterprise features, so if you want to try like, um, you know, role-based access controls behind the firewall stuff, whatever, um, you can actually just ping the sales team. Uh, now, you don't have to get a demo, but they will set you up. If you fill this out, they will actually set you up with uh, an evaluation license with all of the features unlocked so you can go and do everything that you need to do. Um, any other questions that we should call out? Um, I, well, there is, uh, so are there any complications during configuration of this system? Hmm, complications of configuring this system. Well, okay, so so uh, I've talked, I talked a little bit about Bazel. I think that Bazel configuration can be fairly complex um, because, and it's one of the reasons that Bazel isn't as popular with open source projects as uh, you actually see a lot of projects um, that, especially if they're using Go, they'll use, they'll move to Go Build instead of uh, instead of Bazel, uh, just because it can be kind of complex to configure. But again, if you if even if you don't go to that level of optimization, if you're just using the Docker cache, uh, if you're just using the distributed volume within CodeFresh. Um, there's basically very almost no configuration you need to do to immediately get big benefits and you can spend additional time to go and maybe tweak where those caches are being stored um, from a volume perspective um, but uh, but most of the most of the benefit is going to come just from using that distributed cache in the background um, and somebody actually asked are there open source distributed cache systems available uh, <laughs> the answer is a lot of people reinvent that wheel by, by using like S3 bucket mounts, but they essentially have to write all the rules for their own systems to do that. So I'm not aware of any um, comprehensive distributed caching system. Now, Bazel actually does have a way to use a distributed cache for its components, which you can also use inside of CodeFresh, um, uh, which is essentially an S3 bucket. But again, you do, need to, you do need to actually mind the rules around it of when that cache should be available and when it shouldn't be available. So for example, on a pull request, you, you maybe don't want that cache to be available because it could contain sensitive information or something like that. So uh, great questions. This is actually really yeah. good feedback. And um, I don't know if we run a poll afterwards. I, I hope that everybody enjoyed it. And uh, I would really appreciate any comments that you have uh, or hit me up on Twitter at today was awesome um, to let me know uh, if, uh, if you liked this content, if you want more of this content, um, or if you thought it was awful, send me, send me your email <laughs> and tell me what I, what I Tell me how ashamed I should be of myself. And I seriously doubt you'll get anything like that, Dan. <laughs> but you never know. You never know. Hey, um, thanks to everybody who submitted questions. We had a ton of them, so uh, and they were all really, really good. So uh, thank you so much. I, I don't want to cut you off, Dan, but we, we're a minute to the top of the hour. I do have to do that gift card drawing. So um, why don't I go ahead and do that real quick? Our first winner for the $50 Amazon gift card is uh, Brandon Merrick. Congratulations, Brandon. Our second winner is Udaya Chandran Morthy. Congratulations. And I apologize if I mispronounced your name. And our final winner for today's $50 Amazon gift card is Gary Gutman. So congratulations to all three of you. Um, also want to remind the audience real quick that today's event has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of it, or if you just want to watch it again, you'll have the opportunity to do so. Uh, we will be sending out uh, a, an email later on that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And the webinar is also going to be living on the DevOps.com website. So you can always go there. Just go to DevOps.com slash webinars, look in the on demand section, and it will be right there. Dan, as always, great presentation. Thank you so much for, 
for giving such a great discussion. I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you. All right. And I hope we'll see you again soon. And I also want to thank the audience for joining me today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I am signing off. Have a great day, everybody. Bye.